If you're interested in building a budget 300 PRC rifle or having one built for you, this video is for you. Gavin Gear here from UltimateReloader.com. This is the kickoff of what will be a two-part series chronicling my adventure taking a 300 Remington Ultra Magnum factory Remington 700 long range rifle and turning it into a match quality 300 PRC rifle. In this video, I'm gonna go over kind of all of the tools, components, parts, and pieces, and we're gonna specifically walk through my experience running through Gordy's action blueprinting process for the first time. And then in the next video, we're gonna talk about the process chambering, this benchmark barrel blank, and walking through the rest of the process so that we'll have a completed rifle. Let me walk through first all of the tools, components, parts, and pieces. So we've got a Bell and Carlson stock. This is what comes factory with the Remington 700 long range rifle. We've got the bottom metal and hinged floor plate. We've got the internal magazine. I'm thinking I'll probably run those to see how it feeds, but I've also from Accurate Mag got a bottom metal and two 300 PRC length box magazines. I do like to run detachable mags. For me, it's a readiness thing and a safety thing. We've got the factory barrel that I've already taken down. We've got the benchmark blank. This is for 26 inch finish length, five lands, five grooves. This is one in eight and a half twist. This is a little bit faster than the full custom rifle. I thought it would be interesting to take a look at Hornady's recommendation, which was this twist rate compared with the slower twist rate that we used based on benchmarks suggestions for the first build. Okay, we've also got an upgraded recoil lug. This is Badger Ordnance 312 width, 312 thousandths of an inch. Significantly beefier than the factory recoil lug, as you can see here if I hold them side by side. This is the same exact recoil lug that I used in my 224 Valkyrie Remington 700 build, and it came out really, really great. It's just really beefy, and it doesn't cost a whole lot either. We've got the receiver, the bolt, and the trigger here, Evolution Gunworks 20 MOA rail. We've got the Vortex Viper 6 to 24 by 50. This is from back in the Ruger Precision Rifle days, that 6.5 Creedmoor Ruger Precision Rifle that I did a number of years back. Had it on hand, thought it'd be a great scope to throw on here. And then from Greg Tannell, Gratan Rifles, I've got his action truing jig. I've got a, an indicator rod and a Remington 700 bushing set. These are really tightly fit. We can put these in the inboard and outboard ends of the receiver and use it to dial the receiver into the spindle of the lathe quite precisely. We've also got a Dave Manson 300 PRC finisher reamer piloted for bushings, and I've got a set of bushings as well. And then also from Dave Manson, the go and no-go gauges. These are the same ones that I used in the original full custom 300 PRC build. Okay, so that's what we've got to work with here. Next, let's talk about the action blueprinting job that I did on this action. So before I get into the specific steps that I went through to true up this receiver, why don't we walk through the critical aspects of the bolt and the receiver body and how they fit together. So with the receiver itself, we've got three things that we need to be concerned with. There's the face of the receiver, which needs to be square. There's the threads inside the receiver, which need to run perfectly concentric. And then there's the lug seats, which need to be even at the same depth from the outside flat face of the receiver. Then we've got the bolt itself. There's a couple things here that are specifically critical. The, the lugs themselves, the back of the lugs, this is what seats itself against the lug seats. And then we've got the bolt face. The bolt face needs to be run perfectly true. And the back sides of these lugs need to be at the same depth so that they can meet up with the lug seats inside the receiver. And so to start, I installed a four jaw chuck on the Precision Matthews PM1440 GT. That's the lathe that I use. And I installed the Gratan action blueprinting jig so that it was running within about a thousandth of an inch of being concentric. I don't like it to wobble too much. It actually doesn't matter, but it's a distraction for me. So I dialed it in. And then it, you need to make sure that your screws are in the right holes. 
Now this is a later setup they used. I'll get to that in just a moment. What I did is I ran them in the outboard positions because we've got a long action here. As you can see with the length there, you want to grab the receiver towards both ends and then you can start to dial it in. The dialing in process is a matter of inserting the appropriate bushings that fit tightly in the bore of the receiver where the bolt body rides. And you want these to press semi-firmly, slip fit with a bit of resistance into place. And you can then slide the indicator rod through. And if your receiver is relatively straight, that rod will slide through. If it doesn't, you might need to make adjustments to, to the bushings. Depends on uh, the quality of, of the receiver. Mine slid right in nice and smoothly. And I was then able to start the indication process. So you've got a large portion of the indicator rod sticking out the end of the jig. I put two indicators, dial test indicators, on this indicator rod and made the appropriate adjustments until it was running true. Here's my philosophy on that. First, start with the radial adjustments near the end of the jig. So if this is in the lay, that was actually this way. You've got the bushing sitting here and you can get an indicator close to that. You want to move these this way and that way until this area is running true. Then you focus on the outboard end. Now we can use the opposite set of screws to basically work on our rotation until that's running true, which is going to slightly throw off the radial uh, alignment. So we go back, we get the radial set, and then we go out, we get the angle set, and so on and so forth until both indicators are reading within about a total indicator reading of about one to two ten thousandths of an inch. That's going to be adequate for the truing of the receiver. Then I started to focus on the threads. And let me tell you, this is probably the hardest part of the job because it's hard to see what you're doing when you're threading internally. And if you're just cutting threads internally, you just get things set up and you can progressively increase your depth at whatever angle you're at. I'm typically at 29 degrees. And you just keep cutting until you're at the appropriate diameter. Well, here we've got existing threads and we've got to get the tool adjusted, the single point cutting tool adjusted at just the perfect orientation with respect to the threads. And what Gordy Gritters has you do is he has you start on the face of the threads that are the critical one. That's the faces that are pointing inwards, the ones that you can't see when you look in the end of the receiver. So I used the Hawkeye borescope, I used a mirror, and aligned the tool so that it was above the face of the thread and would start to clean up the thread about two thirds of it. And proceeded to come, come down each, each time, make a progressive cut until that was cutting perfectly true all the way around. And then you advance the, the tool down until it gets to the trough of the thread, that root of the, the thread. Once you get all the way down there, you actually back the tool up a little bit and then start to clean up the back face. Gordy specifically has you not touch the back face because his theory is if the back face influenced the front face, then you're going to get it running out of true again. So just get one side of the threads running perfectly true and then clean up the other side so that there's a little bit of clearance when the threads from your threaded tenon on your barrel screw into the receiver. That took quite a bit of time and I did run into one problem, which was some chatter on the, the back side of the threads, the non-critical side. And what I did was I rotated the chuck by hand and did the threading by hand, which is something that's perfectly fine to do. And I found it cleaned off that chatter right away because it's not running at that speed where that resonance is occurring. I could have done it under power, but when you're threading internally, there's a certain point when you get to the stopping point where you've got to withdraw the tool quickly. And I felt it would be safer for me, instead of speeding up the lathe, to just do it by hand and just take a very careful look. I spent hours on these threads because it was a matter of me developing my technique, me getting the appropriate tools and the specific process that I was comfortable with in place and not messing up this receiver. Cause let me tell you, that would be a very easy thing to do. One slip and you could cut the threads too large, 
cut them out of true, whatever it is, something gets knocked and the receiver is no longer running true to the lathe. So my advice is take your time. After I got the threads totally trued up, I faced the front. And let me run through some numbers real quick. So my initial measurements were, and I did this with a tenth indicator on the threads, the thread concentricity, there was a total indicator reading of two thousandths of an inch. So we had plus or minus one thousandth of an inch, which for you know a custom grade action is quite a bit. We want to tighten it up to where it's basically near zero. The front face of the receiver had a run out of plus or minus three tenths, so it had a total indicator reading of six ten thousandths of an inch. I cleaned that up. The next area we need to take a look at is the lug seats. This is where the, the lugs on the bolt are going to sit against and they're holding pressure against. And what I found with my tenth indicator was that one of them was two thousandths of an inch deeper. That might not sound like a lot, but that actually is because under all of the tremendous forces, especially for 300 PRC that are happening when you fire the rifle, those lugs will contact the seats. And if there's an air gap, that means that there's deflection in order to make those lugs contact the, the lug seats. And that means a deflection of the barrel, which means an opening up of your groups. Absolutely. This is, in Gordy's class, one of the most important factors that he points out for the action in action blueprinting. So I discovered that they were out of spec, they were at a different depth of two, two thousandths of an inch, and I proceeded with a boring bar to go in there and to clean them up so that they were just barely cutting on both sides. And so I probably took off about two and a half thousandths total, something like that. And at that point, I was done with the receiver body itself, nearly, we'll get to that in just a moment. Then it was time to take a look at uh, the bolt itself. And what I did was, so that I could fit the bolt into the jig, I cut this slot on the side of the Gratin jig. If you do that, it makes a perfectly good uh, bolt fixture. So what I did was, I, let's move this around here. I positioned the bolt so that I had both sets of screws contacting the bolt body and I had probably about two and a half inches here protruding from the jig. That meant I had a couple different spots that I could indicate off of and adjust the screws accordingly until the bolt body was running absolutely perfectly true. At this point I put my tenth indicator on the back side of the lugs, the critical side, and I found that they were at the same dimension, the same distance from the end of the bolt within about two ten thousandths of an inch. So I decided I'm not gonna cut them, I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna lap them when I'm all done. Special consideration with that I'll mention in just a moment. So then I took my tenth indicator and rotated the spindle of the lathe while reading right off of the bolt face. And what I found was the bolt face had plus or minus a half of a thousandth for one thousandth total indicator reading, which is pretty bad for a bolt face. So I thought to myself, well, what am I going to do here? Because I've got the extractor here that is a, an integral part. It can't be removed from this specific bolt in, in this Remington 700 factory action for, for this Magnum caliber. And so I needed a tool that I could reach around that extractor with. And I ordered a few online with some indexable tooling, some small boring bars that have an offset, kind of a hook angle. Uh, but then I went over to my grandpa's metal lathe, his 1947 South Bend, and I looked through his door. Grandpa's no longer with us, but I'll tell you, multiple times I've had a need and <laughs> he's come through for me. Sure enough, I find a quarter inch piece of high speed steel stock that he had hand ground with a little hook kind of contour, just what I needed to true up this bolt face. So I very carefully took a pass and, until it was cutting halfway around and not cutting on the other side. So we're probably at about a half of a thousandth of an inch at this point. And then I carefully advanced it with a DRO so that I took off 
just over a thousandth of an inch and I had it cutting cleanly all the way around, which you can see here in the end of the bolt face here. The last step, so I'm done with the bolt now, was to remove the bolt from the fixture, install the bolt in the receiver with the trigger installed to lap the lugs. That's why I didn't take that extra two ten thousandths cut on the back side of the bolt lugs is because I knew that would easily come off with lapping and I was gonna lap anyways because when you've got the trigger installed, it imposes a very, very, very slight tilt because you're pushing up on the back of the bolt. And that's the condition where you wanna do your lapping so that the bolt lugs are contacting the lug seats exactly how they will be when the rifle is cocked and ready to fire. Then when you fire the rifle, Everything is in contact. All of the forces should apply themselves without disrupting the action and the barrel unduly. That's the goal of this whole action truing exercise. And so the job went quite well. It took me quite a bit of time just because this was my first time through Gordy's process, but I'm really glad that I did. I'm glad that I did because I found some things that I know were problematic with this rifle when I shot it initially. It was grouping just under an inch consistently when I was doing my part. And I felt like there was a bit of room there for improvement. Rebarreling with a match grade barrel will help. This action blueprinting will help quite a bit. I'm a believer in that. And then all of the other upgrades that we're gonna go through will be convenience factors, uh, appearance things, and just general enhancements. So that's the summary of my first action blueprinting job. If you want to do this and you have a lathe, I would say just take your time. And if you can, take Gordy's class. He has his in-person class. It's a week-long precision rifle building class. I took it. I wish I could even take it again because it's a lot to take in in a week. But seeing Gordy, who is a master, do his work was invaluable and gave me the confidence to, to take this on and to do it right. Some of these things that I wouldn't have thought about, but he's done this thousands and thousands of times. <laughs> so I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope this has shown you kind of a, a good high level overview of what action blueprinting is. Since this was my first time through the process, I didn't go into super in-depth detail on each step. Don't worry, I'll be covering this stuff many, many, many times over the coming years. And I hope that you'll subscribe with notifications because you're going to want to check out the rest of this build, including the chambering, assembling, and then we're going to compare the performance between this low budget 300 PRC rifle and my full custom. Who's going to win? I guess we're going to have to see. So what do you think of this build? What do you think of this process for truing and blueprinting and action? Please drop a comment and we will start a conversation. Also, don't forget, I've got shirts at the Ultimate Reloader store. I'm on Patreon, and that first link in the video description will link to a more in-depth article with links to product pages and a bit more detail, steps, instructions, that kind of thing. Until next time, happy shooting and happy reloading.